thank you so much again, everyone, for joining us. Uh, really appreciate uh, you taking the time to to uh, to come to this discussion and and participate and and you know get to learn from uh, Ambassador Gujit, uh, Charles Kolo, and uh, one of the other panelists who's going to join us shortly. Uh, my name is George Murake, and I work with, with IntelliCup, um, and specifically with the SunCup team. SunCup is a convener, and we've been doing that for the last um, about 10, 10 years, actually more than 10 years. Uh, we are going uh, looking at convening the 14th SunCup Global Summit in September, so 27th, 28th of September. Uh, and we've been, you know, what SunCup is, is basically a platform that brings together stakeholders that push the, the entrepreneurship agenda forward. Um, bring in stakeholders like uh, you know investors, DFIs, multilaterals, uh, entrepreneur support organizations, the media, the government, policymakers, all with the aim of forwarding the entrepreneurship agenda because we are, we believe that sustainability can be achieved through entrepreneurship. Uh, so you know, thanks again for joining us. Please go ahead and and put in you know where you're coming from, which country, what organization you work for uh, in the chat box, and I think that will really help us to connect. Our moderator for the day is Ambassador Gurjit Singh. Ambassador Gurjit Singh is a former ambassador of India to Germany, Indonesia, Ethiopia, ASEAN, and the African Union. He also chairs uh, the, the CII Business Task Force on Trilateral Cooperation in Africa, including the Asia-Africa Growth Corridor with Japan. Uh, ambassador, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. So thank you, George. Go ahead. Want me to carry on now? Yes, yes. Uh, you can proceed, and then and then I, I will uh, maybe say a few words, and then or, or maybe should I introduce Charles, and then you can take it forward. Yeah, why uh, don't you go ahead? Yeah, I think I think that would be most appropriate. Uh, our, our second speaker on this discussion is Charles Colo. Charles is a senior vice president in sales and marketing at Dream Over Limited. He leads the inter identification of growth opportunities, drives commercial strategy, and executes new business models that expand Dream Oval's market share and presence in the region. Over to you, Ambassador. Thank you very much, George. I'm so happy to be back on the Sankal Forum once again. Dear friends, a very good afternoon from a very hot Delhi. I think uh, most of you are probably in cooler climes, but I am sweltering right now. But being with you is always enthusing. And uh, my last book on which this program today is named is The Harambe Factor, which is a pretty large, fat, heavy book dealing with India's economic and development partnership with Africa. The reason that book was written was that most often you can read about Europe, the United States, China, and what they do with Africa. But what India does with Africa is known only in comparison. And so this book compares us with nobody, but just talks about the partnership with Africa, which I believe is different. It is not a lighthouse partnership. It is a day-to-day -day partnership. It works every day, and you see it all around you. And it is a partnership for more equals. And that is where the Harambe factor comes from. Uh, a few basic facts, George mentioned them. India's investment in Africa, private investment, is about $70 billion. India-Africa trade is about $70 billion. India's soft loans in Africa are about $12 billion. But when I surveyed people in Africa, well, to them, it was the private investment. It was the, uh, you know, startups and the venture capital which was the most important thing that they wanted from India, not only the government program. So in association with Santal, we decided that in the spirit of the book, Dharabha, let us look at some of these ideas which are in the concluding part of the book, talking about the future and saying, what is it that India and Africa need to do? Basically, they need to involve the private sector more. They'd like to see what the private sector is doing and how can we encourage that without stomping it out because you know governments can be pretty heavy handed at times so we need to be careful of that and if something is flourishing let it be if something needs help help it but don't try and nudge it into your own mold that was the basic point the book made towards the end and in which 
impact investment, achieving the SDGs, using technology for good, all that plays a very big role. And therefore, I'm very happy that today we are going to be talking about FinTech. Now, it is also important to note that today, if you talk to anybody about FinTech, it is Africa on top. In fact, just before this program, I was on a program of India and ASEAN where they were talking about digital technology and you know, investment. And even they said, most of the money seems to be going to Africa. So we need to watch what's happening over there. And India, which if you take a South Asia, after Africa, we are the second largest attractor of funding for fintechs. But we are probably one quarter of what Africa obtained in the last year. One of the things which happens in India, as, as the young Indians who grew up, we did not need fintech because the money order came to our doorstep. So the postal system in India was the physical way of money transfers. Anybody, anywhere used to send a money order. And the postman who delivered letters, and in India, we have a very vast network of postal offices, used to bring money. So within India, the migratory people who went, let's say, to Mumbai and sent money to a village in Uttarakhand used money order. Today, they have moved towards more UPI. So they use uh, payment interfaces. And through India Stack, now, India Stack is a bit of a misnomer because it is not only aimed at India. It is essentially a moniker for set of open API and digital public good that aims to unlock the economic identity, data, and payment at population. Although the name bears the word India in India Stack, it is not limited to India. It can actually be replicated anywhere in a developed country or an emerging This project was conceptualized and first implemented in India, where it rapid adoption by billions of individuals and businesses has helped promote financial and social inclusion and position the country. Now, today we heard in the newspapers in India that 5G spectrum is going to be now, coming of 5G spectrum is much faster operation and expectation is that industry, individuals, all of them will benefit much more from the applications that are developed in India, take the benefits to the common people. So, thanks, well, not thanks, due to the pandemic, the payments by mobile or internet payment was largely a urban phenomenon. It has now moved to the rural areas, replacing the money order that I told you. So when we speak to the panelists, I would like to hear about this. What about penetrating the rural space? Is that something which is happening? The second aspect is how are we going to use this pan-African now, one of the things the Harambe factor talks about are the new opportunities under the Africa Continental FTA. And the biggest advantage for India, and this is what in the survey that the book has, Africans wanted was more investment from India because Indian investors always looked at regional markets in Africa. They were not so export-oriented to, let us say, many countries, except there were some, but a lot of them at the SME level were basically looking at domestic and regional markets. Now, the Africa Continental FTA promises these regional markets with much more ease. So, once you have these regional markets, the possibilities of trade facilitation, which includes ease of payment, keeping exchange rate risk in mind, 
will again be a great boon to fintechs. And this is again something I would like to hear that how does regional trade help the business of fintechs and inversely, how do fintechs support regional trade in Africa and exports beyond domestic markets? Thirdly, the world grapples with many shocks. One of them is the Ukraine crisis. That is a man-made shock. But there is the COVID crisis, which is not man-made. It's like a natural disaster. But all of us have fallen prey to it. And now we have to have a recovery. In this recovery, technology will play a great role. So where does fintech and related technology now play a role in Africa today, the Africa of 2022. When I started writing my book in 2020, it was a different world. And when I finished my book, it was still not, the impact of COVID was still not complete. Then I had to substantially rewrite the book because of COVID. And many of the assumptions my book started with had to be revised. But one of the assumptions still remains the same which is that India is a youthful country with the median age of 27. But compared to this, Africa has a median age of 19, with almost 40% of African people actually being under the age of 15. So it's a very young population. There's another part of the book spoke about the heavy penetration of mobile telephones. Now, in India, mobile telephones rapidly went through and everybody has a mobile telephone. You want to call the plumber, he has a mobile. You want to call the carpenter, he has a mobile. Now, what is the penetration in Africa? Is it socially stratified or is it useful to the economy? Now, let me stop here, having raised a few questions. And let me now call upon Mr. Charles Kolo, who is currently in Ghana, and uh, ask him to please tell us about what he does on fintech. What are his dreams that he dares to have about doing fintech in Africa? And if you feel convenient, address some of the issues I raised before we enter a more fulsome discussion. Over to you, Charles. Thank you very much, Ambassador, for this uh, introduction and for this um, for 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 sharing some of your thoughts on the on the subject. I think that is a very important subject. So my name is Charles Colo. I'm leading sales and marketing at uh, Jumova. I'm senior vice president here for for sales and marketing. And uh, what we do at Jumova is that we develop technology solutions that help the development of the middle class. So. We are focused uh, mostly one of our main mission is supporting the middle class. And uh, you will understand that uh, as we go into this discussion, this is something that is at the heart of, uh, of uh, the development that we believe we can bring to the, to the continent and to uh, the ecosystem as a whole. So uh, we, have, uh, we are working today with a lot of different uh, large brands to facilitate the collections. We are working with uh, the largest port in West Africa, West and Central Africa. We are working with uh, some very uh, heavy uh, e-commerce uh, companies here in um, in Africa with insurances, with different uh, group of uh, of, uh, of businesses in Ghana and outside of Ghana. We see ourselves as a Pan-African uh, company. We uh, are launching a payment. Uh, app that will be uh, present in different markets, in different regions as well. Um, and uh, we, the, the intra-African trade is really dear to our heart. And um, personally, I understand some of the challenges that uh, we are facing that are linked to infrastructure, financial infrastructure, physical infrastructures, um, the, the middle class challenge, the education challenge as well. And uh, we are, we play in these different um, in dif in these different uh, areas. So to to address some of the of the point that you mentioned about uh, about fintech, it's important to define the the word fintech first so that we all understand it from a single point of uh, of reference. So fintech is a acronym for financial technology. 
And that means that uh, we are, so we started as, a, as Dreamoval as a technology company uh, to develop services to banks, uh, services to different financial institutions. And we evolved into, of course, being a pure player into the fintech space. What does that mean? Is that we are not a bank. We are not uh, positioning ourselves as a bank. We are, we are bringing uh, additional value to what the banking system is bringing to the in industry. There's a big um, question often that I tend to answer where people ask us, okay, so are fintech a threat to banks or are bank a threat to fintechs? I think that is not really relevant because I believe that we can bring uh, value uh, together to the markets and the market, to be honest with you, is um, so underpenetrated at the moment that uh, it's better to work together in, um, in the region rather than trying to find areas of um, point of challenges. I think that is not relevant at this point. When we get to a penetration of 80%, we can talk about competition, about these different things. But now uh, from what I've seen on uh, digital payments, we are, probably, we are less than 5% penetration of the market in volume, in, uh, meaning as a, uh, as a medium of exchange uh, that compares to cash one-to-one. -one. Um, when you look at value, it's bigger, but when you look at, uh, at uh, volume, it's much, much, much uh, smaller. So there's a lot of things to do. Um, intra countries, that's one thing, uh, because it's important to, uh, Africa is a very um, um, fragmented market where, um, it's, a, it's a fragmented market where we have to work with different central banks. We have to work with different governments, different rules, different legislations. Uh, we go from um, um, a region to the other region. For example, we have some, uh, some type of political instability. You see what happened uh, lately in Mali, in Burkina, in Guinea, in, um, in other different places. The, the, you also see a lot of opportunities. You mentioned the youth aspect and the fact that there are so much uh, things to do with the youth. Uh, we are very well aware of this uh, challenge. And by the way, we, we, we have different programs that uh, support the youth and uh, development in, uh, in STEAM uh, technology. So this, we really believe that there's a lot of things that we can do um, as, a, as a company. And uh, we also believe that, um, that when it comes to the intra-African trade, there's still a lot of room to grow. Um, so now that I define fintech and a little bit about what we are what we are doing, so when it comes to the support of regional trade, so we are uh, bringing uh, a connection, uh, an additional layer to what the banks are doing. So based on this uh, setup and this financial, uh, yes, based on this financial uh, setup and technology, we have the capability to bring technology that will uh, support the bank to go to the next step. So uh, banks um, in general, so the, 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 ma the main activity of banks is to store money, to uh, give loans, to, um, yes, mostly store money and give loan to, to people with the money that they store, basically. And a um, lot of banks decide to tell themselves, okay, so why not go into fintech? So they add a, a, a tech layer to that. But the challenge with the tech layer is that it comes with all the marketing, all the product and development, or that's a different business as a whole. So the, the, the risk that banks have when they go into this space by themselves is that they have to, to change the, the way they, they, they think about uh, the banking activity in itself. And by changing the way they think with the banking activity in itself, they actually transform into a more technology uh, company. But that's a different, that's a, diff, that's a really different activity. So uh, what we, uh, at, as I was mentioning earlier, I think that the collaboration with FinTech and banks uh, at the, um, a, a, as we stand where we stand right now is the best way to scale fast and to provide value because it's always a question of providing value to the people we serve um, and um, uh, provide value faster to the, to the industry um, and, and not, uh, try to solve problems that we uh, that have already been solved by individual financial technology companies so uh, that's that's how I, I see the thing so uh, to to tell you a little bit about the challenges that i see in the industry today 
I see, as I was mentioning, the middle class challenge. Uh, we need, so in order to increase the intra Africa trade, we need to uh, increase the in country trade with giving access to people to buy more because by them buying more, that means that they have more needs. There's the supply and the demand, very easy concept. So by them being able to buy more, they require more goods faster. And then that justify the fact that, okay, so some local businesses will decide to, to, to invest in, uh, in building this, uh, this good for the, for the new demand that is generated by this new class of people. Um, after we go into the cross-country uh, trade, um, in, uh, intra-African country trade, that uh, there are several um, initiatives that, have, that uh, people are working on. I know that the central bank digital currency is something that is in the process. The Pan-African payment system, PAPS, is something that is uh, already in the, in the system as well. Um, those are, so for the PAPS, for example, those are tools for fintech and for banks. This is not... The, this is not a solution where this is this is one element of the solution, but after we will need to collaborate in order to use this uh, tool in order to uh, facilitate the ex the financial exchange um, as we are trying to build this uh, financial infrastructure. And after the last one is of course the infrastructure, physical infrastructure. So to move, um, to export a, comp a container from uh, one African country to the other requires, and that's an average, I, I, I did this, uh, this research um, a few weeks ago. So that requires an average of 56 custom uh, signature, 83 uh, documents, about uh, 634 pages of documents, uh, 84 custom stamps, uh, 28 certificates, five invoices, just to uh, move uh, the container from one country uh, by truck to the other. And that's, that, that's, a big, um, that, that's a big friction when it comes to the movement of goods. Um, when we look at the US uh, moving a truck from um, Dallas to New York uh, will take you about, um, about two days and moving a truck from uh, Accra to Douala will take you uh, probably maybe, yeah, probably a week actually, uh, if you are lucky. So that's the type of uh, friction that I see in the, in the industry. And to be honest, this is not necessarily something that can be fixed with FinTech. We fix the payment aspect from one uh, point A to point B. And after we work with the bank and the Nostro Vostro and the way they are moving the money from one location to the other. This is something we can do. After when it comes to the tracking, facilitating the physical exchanges and the physical infrastructure, this is another challenge. When it comes to uh, the tracking of the, of, the, of the goods to simplify the signature, the documents, the stamps, the uh, something very simple, the invoices. So invoice is a concept that is very, very uh, simple to understand. But the thing is that once you have to uh, certify the invoice with a stamp, a physical stamp, for example, that makes the trade, especially in the post-COVID era, very, very uh, difficult because now you cannot move a good if you don't have a physical stamp on a physical piece of paper. And uh, that's the type of, uh, so of things that can be fixed, for example, for this specific subject with blockchain very, very easily. After, um, this is another subject for another day, I'm sure, but this is where uh, FinTech stands. This is what we do in FinTech in the region. And that's the value. I'm always uh, turned toward the value that we provide to the people that we are serving. That's the value that we want to, to bring to, to the industry. So um, thank you for this, uh, this first uh, discussion. And you're on mute, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Uh, most interesting. So evidently, from what you said, financial technology has revolutionized the global financial sector, and particularly in Africa, and fundamentally changed how we can store, save, invest, transfer, and borrow money. FinTech is now regarded as a business application, process, or model enabled by a combination of business, technological, and financial innovation. 
Now, sometimes technology can overwhelm you. <coughs> so, <coughs> pardon me. You know, you've spoken about how the business end, the financial end, the payments end is resolved. So while it may take a week to move a truck from Accra to Dwala, as you said, the payment will be much faster. Now it can be begin the beginning of it, can be the end of it, but it can happen rather quickly. Now, therefore, we have to see fintech as a part of overall trade facilitation. Simply improving fintech is like giving you a TV to watch Netflix when you don't have enough food to eat. So I think you need to improve the infrastructure for trade facilitation, and essentially fintech becomes a positive gain for building regional and global supply chains and trade relationships. Now, I want to specifically ask you that in the case of the SMEs, you know, there are greater demands because about most of African work in the business sector is through SMEs. Because uh, in my book, I have quoted this, there are about 700 companies in Africa whose turnover is about a billion dollars a year. But half of them are in South Africa and another half are in North Africa leaving very few for sub-Saharan Africa, leading to the conclusion that much of the businesses in sub-Saharan Africa are through SMEs. So therefore, what we do should be to support SMEs. Now, I came across this. African Union launches Smart Finance Digital Banking Initiative for micro, small, and medium enterprises, which comprise 90% of total business units in Africa. And this is in February 2022. The African Union initiative was to support African SMEs, women, and youth to realize financial self-sustainability, build market and investor confidence, and ultimately accelerate Africa's economic growth. Now, for Africa to become a meaningful and proportionate shareholder of the global digital economy, it needs to leverage on data and commercial intelligence to benefit the masses of SMEs, young startups, youth and women, the African Union said at the launch. And to facilitate this, this American, African Start Finance, Smart Finance and Digital Banking Initiative would deliver loans, it said, to billions in different countries at low interest, accelerated cycle of service delivery. Now, apart from reducing the risk of transfer of funds and consequently the cost of finance, the initiative aims to bring down the loan cycle from three months to three days. Now, this sounds impressive. But I want to ask you, Charles, have you ever heard of this initiative by the African Union? So, uh, no, I have not heard about this specific initiative. We have other initiatives that uh, I, I can present, uh, other different, other models, but I have not heard about this specific initiative. Can you uh, tell us about the the volume, the amount that they are, that they will be releasing to the region? I don't know if uh, you have this information. Uh, in loans, what is the amount in value? No, they have not given that figure. Uh, I okay. have to dig deeper into it. Okay. Uh, but please tell me about other such supports to SMEs, which you may know about. Yes. So uh, what you what you mentioned, you talked about trust, about investor confidence, about the situation in South Africa, North Africa, and the gap in uh, in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa in the middle. And I think that what you what you mentioned is really true. And the challenge uh, comes into the law of numbers. So 
as I was telling earlier, so we are in a fragmented market where um, it's very difficult to get to the critical size, the critical mass, where it's justify a large uh, company to implement their headquarters in a specific location, for example. So this critical mass is something that can only come from the growth of the middle class. Uh, on, uh, that's my belief. So once we increase this uh, critical mass, we increase the demand, we increase the opportunities and the trade uh, happens. If we block this critical mass from getting to this point where um, the ecosystem is strong, then uh, the, we cannot get to a, a balanced situation where we can live without aid, actually, without a uh, uh, fund external funding. The reason why we need external funding is because we don't have critical mass. Uh, when it comes to the loan, uh, so us at Dreamover, we are working with uh, with, uh, with, a, with um, a group that is called Medical Credit Fund, where that release of uh, loans to the hospitals. So they they have been uh, created just to support the hospitals because where we are in Africa today, you can die because of one hundred dollars from being sick to dying because of 100 hours. And the reason why, you, why, why it happens is because people don't have access to loans, the medical facilities don't have uh, cash flow. It's very difficult to access um, um, additional working finance loans and all that for different reasons that uh, I would be happy to, to discuss after. But it's very difficult for SMEs to get access to finance because the banks that, are, as I was mentioning earlier, that stores money and give uh, loans, they can only give if they are sure that the money will be back in, in some ways. We live in an in environment that is, um, as I was mentioning earlier, in volume where you don't have as much volume of digital transaction as what we uh, think. We have a high value, but we have a low volume, meaning that uh, the person that goes to pay for their medical services, that pay for their bread, that pay for their basic need for a little bowl of rice and all that, usually will not use digital um, uh, way of, um, of paying, or at least they will not use a card, a more, trans more traditional uh, way of paying that are managed by banks. So banks, in terms of digital payments, they are uh, managing um, yes, mostly card in terms of digital card payments and uh, wires. Uh, that's where mobile money, uh, digital, the mobile money comes into play and makes a lot of sense. But the thing that is challenging for the banks at this, uh, at this time is how do you create a credit score on people that receive mobile money? That's really challenging. And that's where uh, a company like Medical Credit Fund, for example, that is specialized again on, uh, on financing hospitals needs, need to work with a company like uh, Dreamoval that will then uh, be able to help them score this, this, uh, these facilities. Because when someone goes in a village to pay for um, uh, a bill of $5 to, uh, to support, the, um, to support their, um, a help, a elder in their community, they will most probably use either cash or mobile money. But the thing is that the bank cannot give a, a loan to this medical facility because they don't know, they don't see this transaction. So uh, that, that's, the, we, we get back to the critical mass that I was mentioning about. So FinTech, uh, I believe, bring trust between the different parties, bring visibility um, with the different parties, bring transparency in the different exchanges. Um, the, the, this aspect of critical size and uh, critical mass of people using, um, uh, exchanging, in a way that is visible that, so that it helps the bank um, give um, more intelligent um, uh, decision um, uh, and help them with the, with the credit score is extremely important. So again, to go back to this concept with medical credit fund, in order to support the access to loans, um, hospitals need to show that they have, they have a certain volume of activity that is not just uh, the uh, judged by the amount of money that they have in a bank account, but it's also judged by the volume of transaction that they are having. So they, they can uh, measure the, the um, uh, a hospital solvability by seeing that monthly they receive X number of payments um, um, 
X number of payments, individual payments with mobile money or cash using our platform, for example, and uh, also bank uh, payment with cards and all these things. But they have a, they can provide a better visibility on um, on um, on the on the different transactions. And um, and after so I talked so the way we support SMEs that's through loans and by exchange mechanism as well, facilitating the um, the, um, the collection. There's a lot of people that are not able to accept a visa payment just because they don't know that we can provide uh, fintech can provide them with a platform that will not cost them anything to implement and that will help them to have a direct payment link, for example, just as simple as a payment link. And uh, that's something that we are providing. And when we find a way to communicate this value properly, uh, I have an example for you. So I had an issue with my car about a month ago where I needed to fix it. So I stopped in the side of, uh, of the street for, to ask to, to fix uh, something on my car. And uh, I paid the person that came with, he didn't have, uh, a visa accepting POS type of things, but I paid them with our, uh, our mobile, mobile app. And I did a switch from my card, from my, my uh, visa card to his mobile money. So this switch mechanism means that this person on the, on the side of the street that helped me, helped me with my car, with my car, I've been able to pay him to do a, a, a visa transaction in the middle of the street. So when we look at that, we see that the use of, uh, of, um, of digital uh, technology to help people collect more money is amazing because if he didn't have that, I would not have been able to pay him at this very moment. So that's one, uh, one um, a, a, a sale in, uh, that, that he would not have been able to make. So that's why this is what we'll be able to bring trust between the different parties, uh, facilitate exchanges, SMEs uh, help them collect more and exchange more in a more transparent way, and also help them build their credit score in a way that the, the West doesn't really need to have this way of uh, measure the, measuring the credit score because people exchange from bank account to bank account mostly. But here people exchange in cash, people exchange in mobile money, exchange using USSD. USSD, that's the, the short code that is being used to pay. Um, use, they use card as well with uh, payment processing. But when you look at the bankerization um, uh, rate in the zone, that is about, that is between 20 and 30% in Sub-Saharan Africa. That means that 70% of the exchanges and uh, the people that, that would be able to accept a loan actually cannot accept, cannot uh, uh, get a loan because their transaction is outside of this, um, of, of this, uh, of this um, um, traditional way of, uh, of transacting for the bank. So that's, that's what I would like to, to add to, um, to, this, uh, to this discussion here. Most interesting, Charles, what you said. And uh, it is evident that you are dealing with the real problems on the ground and trying to use technology to resolve them. I remember that during the COVID pandemic lockdown, when there was a scare that you should not be touching currency notes, you know, the vegetable pop-ups, they were all accepting mobile to mobile money in India. So suddenly the, in the pandemic, the digital payments took a leap forward for not natural reasons, but they did. Now you mentioned this thing about SMEs not being able to get uh, adequate funding. So that is why we have the Sankalp Forum. Basically, if you have SMEs or new ideas which are implementing the SDGs, then the Sankalp Forum provides you avenues to secure uh, financing, which is not equity, which is not a loan, but it is more equity, which will help you grow. So that is one alternative way that we provide. Other thing, when you said that you had never heard of the African Union thing, now, this is the problem the African Union has. They keep having good intentions, but the targets of their intentions rarely know what the big papa sitting in Addis Ababa is saying. And this unfortunately is true. Uh, then there is also, you know, the idea about you know, credit cards making a lot of money. 
So in India, we have a rupee local card, which all Indian banks will happily issue you in place of your visa or master. And slowly it is being used in Abu Dhabi, Singapore, where a lot of Indians go. And it is directly paid in rupees. It is not charged in. Now, I want to know, as a fintech in Africa, how do you make money? How do you make a successful business? So um, that's a, that's a very good uh, question. So first, to go back on the on the African discussion, um, the the African Union uh, discussion. I think it is a question of a distribution network. So someone that has a good idea and good intention, if they don't have the uh, enough of a distribution network, the problem is that people will not know about this, uh, unfortunately. And um, I, I would be very happy to work with the African Union to support them in, um, in uh, reaching the, the, the users in the markets where we are present. By the way, I didn't mention that earlier, but we are present in, uh, in Ghana, Zimbabwe, uh, Lesotho, uh, Côte d'Ivoire. We are about to start in Guinea. Um, and uh, we have a very aggressive extent, uh, growth plan as well uh, to to, to, to become the, Af the Pan-African app that we want to be. So um, the, other, um, uh, the other question about how do, does a FinTech uh, makes money in, um, in Africa is by providing uh, additional value to the, to the users. So um, by uh, providing uh, solutions that they need, that's why when we talk about, so um, traditional finance have, made money a certain way. I, I told you about the bank with uh, the concept of storing money, money and giving loans. So when you store money, you can invest the money. When you give loan, you get uh, money on the loan that you give. After when you are in a transaction on the payments, you need to add a little um, uh, payment fee for convenience. Uh, so instead of uh, going to your school, to the to your kid's school and bringing cash that you, so you have to go to the bank, get cash or someone else get cash, bring it to the location, uh, have the risk of people seeing that you have the cash, uh, delivering it to the school. After the school, taking the cash, putting it in a safe, someone else coming to move the cash from the safe to the bank. There's a lot of um, um, steps uh, in here and uh, FinTech help um, uh, reduce this number of steps. And that's how we, uh, we, we, we make money by providing value to the people. So when um, we, we, are, we have to find solution that people think are relevant and believe are relevant because uh, we are not supported by a more traditional way of, um, of um, a more protected way of doing business. We, are, we have to bring real value to the people that they are willing to pay for. And this value can be paid by the person that uh, is selling rice on the side of the street and plantains. And it can be also seen by very large organization as well, because we are reducing steps. We are uh, lowering the cost of finance as well instead of having an accountant that does uh, settlements uh, for once a month uh, for, for two days, we can give them a daily report on the, on the transaction uh, on the dashboard. That's what we do with, uh, we, with some port uh, customers, for example. Uh, so that's the, the type of, um, of, of things we provide. And when it comes to uh, when it comes to the way we we also uh, make money is that if when we work with internal international companies that are doing business in the region, we provide a certain level of re revenue assurance. So we already have customers, so we can expose them to the customers, and we already have uh, payment um, uh, rails. We talked about the distribution network earlier. So this is something that we can provide knowing also that the value that, um, that people see uh, in working with us is that they just have one single platform, one single platform that can manage all the, trans the transaction across Africa. So I told you about the footprint that we have. We're also integrated into 16 banks. What does that mean? Is that if um, I have a large company from the US that wants to go to Kenya and we are not in Kenya to collect money and uh, provide a single, um, a single view of all the transaction in Africa. This is the type of solution that we can provide. Even if we are not in Kenya at the moment, we can deploy a solution like this 
in uh, in a week or in about 10 days for for for, for our customers so that's the type of um, of we, we need to to drive about the value in in the in the whole system we a lot of people tend to to believe in um in as i was telling you earlier about government government aid foreign aid um and uh, protected industries that are uh, secured by the government, like the banking system, where you know that you will not have. Um, so people can uh, understand if you don't bring as much value as the, uh, to the end users, um, because it's a protected industry. So people have to work with you anyway, just like um, electricity or water company. In a lot of places, it's not working because the thing is that we a lot of uh, Government don't look at that like a private um, um, activity, like a private company activity, and they prefer to 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 leave it as a um, as a government owned um, 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 uh, company. So by us having to absolutely delivering value to the end user, that forces us that forces us to listen. To pay attention to bring to understand what people are looking for and if the customer likes what we are selling they buy if they don't if they don't like they just decide to go somewhere else and there are a lot of options that's why we absolutely have to do uh, to work on innovation making sure that the model makes sense for our users uh, speak with them understand that um, we, we we have strength in the numbers uh, it's important that we get to this uh, critical mass that I was uh, talking about. So that's how a fintech makes money in uh, in Africa at the moment. Thank you so much, Charles. Let me try and open this to the floor. I see here Mr. Adunia Haile from the co-founder of Haile Wako Integrated Farm from Ethiopia. Sir, can you tell us, do you use fintech? Mr. Haile. Ato Haile. Are you there? Okay, I can't hear him. I see here Mr. Ravi Pitti, CEO of KPA. Mr. Pitti, would you like to respond to some of the issues that we have discussed today? Your experience in FinTech? Yeah, good afternoon, uh, Ambassador Singh. Uh, so we're, uh, I'm the CEO of KPay, which is a pay-as-you-go technology platform. So we are in the segment of what you call embedded fintech. Our coding or algorithm are integrated into any powered device, allowing for the device to be paid for and given some instructions through our software platform. So this is very uh, useful in the African context, especially for the low income groups, because our technology can be integrated into a cross section of products and applications, such as uh, solar home lighting systems, ho uh, home appliances, farming equipment, water dispensers, uh, and so on. Uh, once a technology is integrated into the product, the user can pay for the product using small digital payment, which could be by way of, uh, like Charles said, USSD or uh, mobile money or any other payment gateways. Our software platform detects that the person has paid this payment for a particular product and sends the signal back to the feature phone being used by the customer or the product itself, if it is uh, SIM card enabled, allowing that product to understand that, uh, say, uh, Charles has paid uh, $1, which is equivalent to 10 hours of usage for, uh, say, a TV. So the TV will understand that it has to function for 10 hours only once it gets a code, after which it will shut off on its own. So, uh, the customer can use the service as and when they have the money and the affordability and the financier or the business owner is also uh, safeguarded from his investment because if the customer doesn't pay, the product becomes a dud. It cannot function. Uh, so it's easier to recover the payments. 
So that is where we come in with KPA, and we feel like you know the future is moving to the service model or this pay-as-you-go model for all products and application. Uh, it has already caught on in Africa, and we are at the cusp of uh, it to take off even in India. And our technology is the catalyst for this business model. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this. Very valuable. I also see Thank here, you. Mr. Uju Uzo Ojinaka, CEO of Traders of Africa. Are you here, sir? CEO Traders of Africa. I don't hear him. Okay. Then uh, we have this person from the DR Congo. Teresa from Congo DRC. Are you here? We have somebody from Tanzania. Are you here? Uh, Ambassador, I think uh, I think some of those may have dropped off, but I, I see uh, I see the gentleman you had called on, uh, Hale Adunga. So maybe if you want to, uh, Adunga, I see yeah, your hand. Please go too. ahead, Mr. Adunga. Yes, I would love to hear yes. from you. Yes, you nice. live, are you <clears throat> in? Are you in Ethiopia? Yeah, I'm from Ethiopia. So you please tell us, do you use fintech? Uh, not yet, but uh, I want to use, you know, fintech, especially in joining, you know, the African continental free trade, uh, given it is implemented. So as I am, you know, uh, have the plan in mind to uh, export to process and export, you know, uh, agri product. Yeah. Well, I think that is a good start that because uh, you are in a good business uh, and uh, yeah. you, I think, would benefit a lot from uh, the FinTech, especially the way Charles has explained it to you. To exactly. Enhance your exports from uh, Ethiopia into other parts of Africa and beyond. So I uh, wish you luck on that. Uh, Mr. Mogoi, Mr. Mogoi, are you here? Would you like to tell us about your experience on this? All right. Um, I hope you guys can hear me clearly. Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, so for me, I was, uh, I've been, um, looking at this from a cooperative lens, uh, because even from our own studies, it's becoming very clear that um, even people who are participating in the gig economy, they want to be the ones who are owning enterprise and also being able to participate in the capital gains that have been realized uh, by those enterprises. So um, I know uh, the discussion is perhaps around FinTech. Um, I joined a little bit late, but but um, what's what's coming out from our studies and uh, trying to understand the gig economy is that people want to be able to uh, to, to create uh, like cooperatives in which they're able to uh, participate in the capital gains that have been realized by the enterprise. Uh, here at Kenya, we have observed a lot of savings and credit business model, but then people, there's a need to actually scale this model beyond just saving and credit to other forms of enterprises like manufacturing, um, so, uh, and and, uh, and and also in some in some kind of services like creating like a service marketplace. Um, and I would I want to to hear even just from other people in the, on this call like how have they been able to. Uh, I think we can't hear him now. Is that correct? Yes, I can hear. <laughs> yes. Yeah, okay. Mr. Mugoi, it looks like your your audio cut out. Could you maybe uh, that last bit? I think is is what we missed. Right. So oh, we right. still have five minutes. So maybe we ask one or two other people. Is Mr. Samuel Kojo Desu here? Yes. 
Yes, yes, I'm here. Yes. Would you like to tell us about your experience with fintech and how do you think some of these issues can help? Oh, okay. So um, I'm a young business development person, but in my experience, I get to use fintech most often because of the kind of customers we have um, who are spread across the different regions. So we have had experiences where customers from far and near um, easily pay at on time. You know, at first we used to have excuses that um, we have to go to the bank and all that, but I think fintech has been good too. Especially in our team, yeah, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What about Caroline Movebri? Are you here? Caroline? Jay-Z Portela, would you like to say something to us? Ambika Chandra, would you like to say something to us? Okay, so I think we're almost done with time. So Charles, may I come back to you? Absolutely, Ambassador. Yes. So would you like to give us a little roundup on what you think should be the next steps? Because I think fintech is something which binds Africa together. So the dream of Pan-Africanism actually comes through technology now. So how do we help in this process? I think that, um, thank you very much. So I think that, um, so from the dream standpoint and the vision that we have for, for the continent, so we believe that um, um, we need to create a one Pan-African payment uh, system that works, that is not just a tool, but also um, has a, a, a strong distribution network in the different countries that have um, different uh, businesses that have buying and that works also with banks. This, this is important. Um, we need to work with, the, um, with the, um, the legal organization. We talked about the African Union, but also I heard a, a gentleman talked about, uh, about AFTA, the African Free Trade uh, Agreement. We, uh, I mentioned the PAPS, the, pay, the, African, the Pan African Payment System as well. So I think that by us creating a group of work and implementing, turning this work into, into um, reality uh, for the, the people that we are serving, because very often we have groups that uh, get together to work, but the problem is that we don't talk about the value that is providing to the, to the industry, to the people in the street that is trying to pay some, for, for something. So by us being focused on the value, on the people, making sure that we have, uh, we are supporting the education because we have a, a young population. Um, we have we have a young population right now. It's important for us to 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 teach them, to give them, giving them access to this technology. It it requires also investment. It requires a significant investment. What happens right now in the African uh, investment market is that um, people are in the business, the business model that, uh, that uh, we've had in uh, Africa for a long time, I really turn toward the mechanic uh, business model. And to explain you what it is, is that uh, we, buy, we buy a fund and uh, we sell it. We buy, then after we buy two funds, after we buy three funds. And that's a very mechanical way of looking at that. When we look at technology, we look at uh, exponential um, business model that can bring much uh, more revenue, but that requires a, a much longer um, um, investment process and a waiting period. The learning curve is, is, is longer. So we need to, to be patient and to attract these foreign capitals. Uh, the market is here. Uh, we need we need um, to 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 support to to work as a, in collaboration with the other um, with, with the other uh, uh, fintech in other region. And I think that one of the solution would be, for example, to have a fintech community uh, committee in every region. So when I say region, that's West Africa, that's Central Africa, that's Eastern Africa. 
that's Austral Africa and uh, Southern Africa for Sub-Saharan uh, Africa, where the goal would be to understand, okay, so what is it that the customer wants? How can we deliver that to the customer? How can we bring value? I'm very always uh, turned toward the value and the, and, and, um, and the perception that, the, that our customer have of, uh, of our service. So um, I think that we will get there. We have to get there because uh, Africa is a huge opportunity. Uh, we are uh, sitting on an amazing uh, opportunity at the moment where the market is growing. There are a lot of initiatives, but it can also become, um, it can also turn into a nightmare if we don't pay attention because these kids that are growing, that, are, that need jobs, this middle class that will be uh, buying goods in the future, if we don't create that, that would be extremely painful for the youth in uh, 25 years. So either we create uh, a continent that is uh, self-reliant uh, with uh, the solutions that are built for this specific continent, and uh, we create the best continent in the world by 2050, or by 2050, that would be a very, very, very complex place to live in. So that's our responsibility. This is what we, this is our mission. This is what we believe in as a company. And um, my name is Charles Colo, uh, again, leading sales and marketing for Dream of Our. Thank you for this invitation. Thank you very much, Charles. And thank you for all the participants over here. I thank the Sankal Forum, George Morage, Ariel Molino, and team. And over you to you, back George, bang on time, one hour. I managed it for you, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador Gurjit. Thank you so much for everyone who's managed to join us. Uh, we will be having similar discussions at the Sun Cup Global Summit, September 27th to 29th. I have put it in the chat box. Please take a look at the website. I'll also plug in my email ID somewhere there. And in case you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. Thank you so much. We will be sharing Thank the you. recording of this discussion. Bye. Thanks so much, Charles. Thank you, Ambassador Gurjit. Thank you.